Hi. My name is Leah Fretwell. Um, I am also in UH's uh, Creative Writing and English Lit program. Um, so on top of doing literature studies, I also do creative writing. Um, I'm actually going to read a little bit um, from a piece that I wrote, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, like Anne did, about my journey to grad school, and then a little bit more about the creative writing program, uh, which is a little bit different than the RET comp program. Um, OK, so this is from a piece called The Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. And it's about two sisters. Um, one of them is dead, and one of them is narrating. And she's looking back and remembering uh, her sister. Um, so, so in this first scene, she is describing, uh, the living sister is describing the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. It was like driving, it was like traveling inside of a jack-o'-lantern or the barrel of a flashlight. The lights went from orange to yellow and back again. We used to hold our breath when we reached it, pinching our noses and stretching their tips like taffy, or blowing our cheeks up until they were speckled with veins and ready to pop. On field trips to Jamestown or Williamsburg, the entire bus would go from screaming to silent in seconds, the teachers relaxing into their seats while we tried to suffocate. On trips across the bridge with our mother, my sister Naomi and I would compete to see who could keep their breath down the longest. Naomi would stare, at me, stare me down, her eyes widening and then shrinking, widening and then shrinking, daring me to break. I always did. Naomi would celebrate by pinching my deflated cheeks so hard that she left little bruises on my cheekbones in the exact shape of her, of her fingertips. I used to think that we had to hold our breath when we reached it. We held it because we were preparing for the worst. I used to think that as soon as we slipped below the water, the orange and yellow lights flashing past, we were in danger, we were vulnerable, we were close to death. The walls would collapse and the ceiling would crush us and we would be drowning and unable to escape. I didn't know how to swim, and Naomi wasn't strong enough to pull me out of the water. We were two seconds from being buried, and we would need to stop breathing to survive until the firemen or the policemen or the coroner could get to us. And if we died, the boat of our corpses would be inevitable, our bodies swelling with water until we were bruised and purple like rotting peaches. I'd seen a drowned body before on the Filipino Channel after a typhoon. It was on the news report. They'd pulled the body out of the water by its ankles and then let it rest on the beach. I was afraid that it would slip out of its skin and a skeleton covered in blood would be left on the shore. Or it would explode like a whale, but it didn't. It just sat there, bloated and blue, until someone came to take it away. By blowing up our cheeks, I thought, we were simply preparing to float to the surface of the water like rafts, ready to be found. Naomi could hold her breath longer than anyone I knew. It blew my mind. She held it way past the tunnel. When we were back above ground, watching the naval ships nesting in the harbor and the cement posts sinking into the water and the birds flying like gnats around the base, skimming the water for fish, she would still be sitting, staring at me, moving her eyebrows up and down, her cheeks blown up as big as a church. It wasn't until years later that I realized, stupidly, too late, one of those idiots who still believes in duendes, or that all sick pets live upstate, that I realized that my sister had never once plugged her nose during our contest. She had stared at me, open-faced, her cheeks fat with air, her thick mouth shriveled like a bad grape, her chest moving softly against her sweater. Um, OK, so in the creative writing uh, program, we study literature. Um, so we have literature classes. We have um, we have, we, we pick a focus area, so there are a couple of streams you can take. Um, so uh, there's critical poetics, right? Um, there's critical studies of the Americas, and then there's translation, right? Literary translation. And so my uh, focus area is critical studies of the Americas. So the way that the program works is that um, we take creative writing workshops where we bring our work in, uh, and we get it reviewed by uh, our professor and also our peers in the class. 
Um, and what they do is they give us feedback and um, we give them feedback uh, and we talk about fiction together. Um, or if you're a poet, you would talk about poetry together. Um, and there's also other classes uh, offered like playwriting. Um, and then we, we, you know, sometimes we do uh, exercises as well uh, where we uh, do some writing uh, based on a prompt. Um, but again, we also take literature classes, so we do have to um, you know, write essays. We have to complete the requirements um, of a literature degree as well. Uh, and then the creative writing is kind of on top of that. So I think we're technically taking more credits than a literature student would. Because um, it, it's like a degree on top of a, a degree, basically. Um, and I guess my, my path to, to uh, the PhD is pretty uh, direct. I got a BA in English, and then I got an MFA in fiction. Um, and then kind of between the BA and the MFA, I worked, actually, because I got an internship doing um, digital marketing. So I worked uh, doing that. And then I worked at a tech company for a little while uh, before I got my master's. And then I did adjunct, kind of like Anne did, uh, where I taught freshman writing and creative writing. Um, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and I decided that I was, an, I was kind of unsure about the PhD. But then the p pandemic and everything that happened around it kind of made me realize that that was what I wanted. And um, I think it was kind of what I needed for my writing, uh, especially. So that's kind of been my path. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so basically, I also want to teach. Um, but But uh, the creative writing PhD, just like um, I think with any writing degree, like I used to work in digital marketing, it can be, be useful in different fields. But also, like along with Anne, I would love to teach, and I would love to be able to teach workshops um, to other creative writers. Yeah. had a job between the MFA and my PhD um, as a literary programmer. Um, so I would develop creative writing classes for a community organization, um, and then also organize reading events. And like, so basically, I could, you know, you know, kind of like a, I forgot what you call it, uh, ed education It's not part of A consultant? Not a consultant. Uh, I did some consulting, though. Um, the. Uh, the curriculum, curriculum design for community. I, there's a word for it that it's escaping me, sorry. Um, but then also, too, so like building community within classes and then also creating events then that would bring people together and it's, to be in conversation with writing. So, um, and then there was also, you know, work, work of writers in prisons, work of writers in, in, you know, elementary and high school as well. There's tons of opportunities to use the degree that are not just strictly teaching, teaching. So, yeah. Um, it has a lot of flexibility. Advertising, like you say. Yeah. You know. yeah. Also, I like I want to write, so that, that's it's it's helpful with that. Yeah. Have you ever published? Yeah. So I've published uh, two short stories or three short stories, but two that I'm proud of. So yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, so the thing that made me mis me decide was that I was kind of miserable doing everything else. <laughs> um, it's that kind of thing, like if you can do something else, then like you, you should do it. But if you can't do anything else and like you feel like it's the thing that you have to do, then you have to do it and you have to pursue it. And that was the case for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. You're not miserable when you're I am not miserable when I write. I love it. It's, it makes me happy. It's the yeah. It's the thing that that I I really love. Along with teaching, teaching is also great. Uh, but but writing is like the thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Patrick, do you wanna? Sure. My journey is pretty similar. Well, it's kind of in between y'all. Um, my name is Patrick. Also, first year um, creative writing PhD at Houston. Um, I. 
I took 27 years to get my undergraduate. Um, I dropped out a lot. Um, I worked at bars, I worked at coffee shops, I was a musician. I pretended to be a painter and an interior designer. I tried all of these things and I sucked at all of them. Um, some I sucked at less, but none of them were fulfilling. And then one day a friend of mine at a coffee shop said, why don't you come sit in on my writing class? Sure, my ex, my wife at the time, now my ex was like, sure, you should do that. He's a writer, he should do it. I wound up, it was, those were the conversations I wanted to be a part of. And I think that when you're making a decision to be about graduate school, that's what it's about for me, is what, what sort of, what you want your life to be consumed by, because it is going to consume it. Um, and I love being at a table with other writers talking about fiction or poetry or books we love. Um, I love pushing the boundaries of what I, what I love about writing is writing pushes the boundaries of my understanding of people, different identities, different cultures. It constantly pushing my awareness of, um, and my compassion and my capacity for, for love. So that's one of the, the, the great things about writing for me is it pulls me into uh, places that I would have never dreamed going. I came from a very different background than the life I live now. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful to writing and writing communities for that. Um, and, uh, you know, sitting at a table, full, your peers are all writing at a really high level and you're being led by someone who's at the highest, one of the highest levels you can go in your field. Those are, those are experiences that I wouldn't trade for anything. And your own work, it's, it's amazing how quickly your own work will improve when you're just sitting at a table with people like Leah, like Anne, who are, you know, at the top of their game as well. Um, yes, there's a lot of competition, but, um, and there's a lot of work. It's exhausting work, tired all the time, but it is absolutely 10 billion percent worth it. Um, in my, so I, I started graduate school in 1980, or started my undergrad in 1989 and graduated after two really long breaks in 2014. Um, and then went straight into a master's program an MFA program for fiction at New Mexico State University um, and uh, graduated, went all the way through, graduated, did, I, I involved, you were asking about organizations and internships and stuff, do all of them, do everything you can, immerse yourself in that community because those relationships are what carry you into your career. Those relationships, like, I'm 100% confident that I got into the PhD program at the University of Houston because of relationships that I was building all along the way. Um, so, do the go to readings or go to you know uh, events like this. Seek out people that work in the, that do the work you want to do, and at least be volunteer if you can't get hired. Spend time in those environments because that's really where you're gonna you're gonna really figure out what sort of academic person you want to be. I happen to want to be a creative academic, but others you know, don't. Um, I love the teaching side of creative writing, but I also, like I say, love the community organizing part of it as well. Um, and fiction is what brought me to those things. Writing brought me to those things, and then it continues to bring, those things bring me back to writing as well. So this book that I hold in my hand was a dream come true. It was part of my master's thesis. I wrote it because I needed to f hit a page limit. <laughs> I'd never written anything that long in my life. Um, I submitted it to a contest one night when I had had a few and forgot about it. <laughs> and then almost a year later, I got an email saying, hey, you won this contest and we're gonna publish it. And uh, I tell you, I hit my knees. Everything that I'd been through along the way was worth it. Um, and. Uh, about a year later, it came out, and um, I'll wrap up my conversation with you with some questions at the end, if you'd like. Um, I don't know how we are. How are we on time? We're good. Oh, we're good. We're good? Okay. We're really good. So I'm going to read like a couple pages at the beginning, and then I'm happy to answer any questions, or if you have questions for the... We read this class, I think, didn't we? Yeah, we yeah. read the first chapter. Yeah, we're from the creative writing class. You are! Yes. Yeah, us three, we are from the Yeah, I thought you were like familiar. Yeah, so yeah, we met with you. It was masks. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we met with you. So you read the first chapter then? We read, we read the first chapter. Well, I won't read that. That's what I was saying. <laughs> so this is a, a, 
it's an, I originally wrote this from um, the point of view of a guy who was getting divorced. It was really sad and mopey and depressing. Um, and all the people that read it in my workshop 